Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome to the guest lecture on diplomatic immunities, evolution, and challenges of the modern era, which is delivered in the context of the CILE Academy 2021. We are delighted to welcome to the Academy Dr. Vilawan Maglatanakul, who will deliver today's lecture. Dr. Maglatanakul is Director General of the Department of Treaties and Legal Affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. She is a career diplomat with over 25 years of experience and with particular expertise in areas of international law, including diplomatic and state immunities, treaty law, intellectual property law, and international economic law. Throughout her career, she has played important roles in international negotiations on behalf of the Kingdom of Thailand. She has been chief negotiator for bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements, and has also played a key role in the Global Initiative on Investor State Dispute Settlement Reform, both at the UN Commission on International Trade Law, as well as at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. She has a keen interest in issues of pressing concern to the international community, such as alternative dispute settlement, the international law on climate change, sea level rise, and the international law in relation to pandemics. Dr. Maglatanaku has been nominated by the Royal Thai government as a candidate for the International Law Commission for the 2023 to 2027 term, becoming Thailand's first female candidate for, to this prestigious position. The moderator for today's lecture is the Academy's co-director, Professor Patricia galvao Teles. She is Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon, an adjunct senior research fellow at CIL, and a member of the International Law Commission. Professor galvao Teles, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Villuan. Let me just... Uh give you a warm welcome on behalf of uh, Nilifer Oral and myself uh, to the CIL Academy. Uh, we are on week five on uh, um, the questions related to diplomatic and consular law and, and diplomatic immunity. So it's really a great pleasure to have you with us um, to share with our participants uh, your views and your expertise. You have, as Harry described, you know, an impressive uh, background in terms of uh, practical uh, experience uh, dealing with all international legal matters and including uh, diplomatic uh, law and, and immunity. So we're really looking forward to your uh, lectures. And I have to say with uh, Nilofer and myself as current members of the commission, we really hope we'll welcome you uh, together um, uh, and we can work together in the commission um, uh, after the uh, forthcoming elections. So, so Dr. Villawan, the floor is all yours and uh, we will have a presentation from your side and then I'm sure our uh, dear participants will have uh, the time uh, to engage with you at the end and, uh, um, and we can have uh, certainly interesting discussion. So uh, the floor is yours and uh, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Patricia, and thank you, Harry, for a kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy and very uh, honored that I've been invited to uh, be able to speak to you. Uh, I know that uh, all of you has been in the um, uh, diplomatic works and inter uh, international affairs works as well. Uh, so some of you are lawyers, I saw it from the list, but some of you are not. So I'm, I'm very happy to share with you the important uh, topic that we are dealing with uh, today. So it's uh, in diplomatic immunity and I hope that you can uh, enjoy it. And, and, and if you have any questions on the practical uh, levels or uh, theory, you can share with me. I have learned that some of you already know of the uh, Vienna Convention on the Diplomatic uh, uh, Relations, which covers privilege and immunity. So I will not touch on the history of uh, the Vienna Convention and how this law is evolved. Uh, through the uh, uh, international uh, developments of law, but I will go straight to the provision of the Vienna Convention on the uh, uh, diplomatic immunity in international law. So um, I will touch on, I will give you some uh, example that happened as well. So in order for you to understand and to see how these issues affect uh, and is evolved 
you know, over the years. And I will share with you at the end, the current uh, issues that has been arising in applying this Vienna Convention of uh, omission on inviability of premises, in um, inviability of uh, uh, personnel, and also uh, 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 immunity from jurisdiction. So let me start with the uh, um, uh, Vienna Convention Article 22 that um, focusing on the inviability of premises. And a premises of the uh, vision uh, of the uh, diplomatic missions, you know, will be uh, uh, free from immune from search and requisition, attachment, or any execution from the local authority, whether that local authority would be police force or uh, any other um, uh, agency such exercising uh, jurisdictions over that. Example that uh, we uh, be given that you know for Thailand we are facing uh, with our uh, one example that recently happened uh, in uh, March 2021. This is a case where you might probably know the, uh, uh, this in the new because this has happened to, in in our uh, royal embassy in Seoul uh, when there is the. Uh, um, the uh, protests against the use of monkey in Thailand, in the coconut business in Thailand. So I mean, for those who are visiting in Thailand, uh, uh, you will see that uh, uh, when you visit uh, uh, coconut um, farms and, and uh, you will see that a lot of us using the monkey in, in uh, catching this uh, coconut for and working for this. And uh, it has been you know, there for uh, many years and um, it had been accepted as one of the tourist attraction promotion as well. You know, it, it's, it's included in our you know, video and the way of life that we are having. But anyway, uh, at that, uh, we have a protest you know, against this use of monkey because of the uh, 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 rights of the animal that, uh, that uh, we are concerned. And uh, that what happened in front of the loyal Thai embassy in Seoul. A man uh, was dressed in a monkey suit and scattered a uh, uh, coconut around the entrance of the embassy and put chain around himself and carry a sign with the message of protest, you know, that, you know, against the use of this monkey. At that time, he didn't enter the premise of uh, the, the, the embassy. He didn't enter into the building but obstructing the entrance of the building. So um, arguably uh, this Vienna Convention Article 25, you know, so have to be uh, considered that whether the host state, in this case is a, a Korean, um, co uh, co uh, Korea, that uh, whether it uh, has provide uh, protection for us, uh, full protection to the embassy or not. And in this case, uh, the um, uh, uh, Korea uh, agencies and authorities, especially through Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has been very cooperative with us and uh, rendered a hand to deal with the situations. And in this case, there is no uh, VCDR provision that was raised. And, and I would give you this because uh, it's, we are talking about premises. And we are not uh, talking about the invade of the premises only, but that can be considered obstructing the, uh, the building or obstructing the entrance of the people to the embassy. That will be considered as, as well as the, um, uh, 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 for members there to provide protection to that as well. So, I mean, that is a case, one case that are uh, 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 concerning Thailand. I will go on to another case. Um, this one is a famous international case. Um, that's, there is a crime. In this case, it's a crime uh, is committed inside the embassy. So the question was raised that how a, a host state can be, you know, um, entering into embassy uh, to prevent the case or to prosecute on the case or not. And uh, the restrictive on this is the provision of the Vienna Convention that uh, 
you cannot enter into the uh, uh, the, um, the embassy premises, as I said from the very beginning. So in this case, it happened in uh, October 2018. Some of you might have heard of the cases of the Jamal uh, Kachoki in the case in this case was killed in the cons in, in the consulate in Turkey. So uh, uh, Tchaikovsky uh, was a journalist who has certain strong political opinion and was in exile in the US prior to the incident. He was invited to a talk in London and later visit Turkey. So why in Turkey? Uh, Shakovsky went to his consulate to obtain a document so he could marry his fiance in Turkey, but did not come out from the consulate again. Inviability of the premises means investigation team could not enter the consulate unless and until they, they, they have gained the consent uh, from the head of mission. In this case would be uh, uh, the uh, ambassador to the, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, in this case it's a, uh, uh, as is the uh, um, consulate, so it's the uh, consulate consul general who has to be able to give the access, you know, permission to access of the local uh, mission. Of course, there are some criticism uh, that uh, there is a delay in investigation because they cannot enter to the crime scene. And also there were a uh, claim that this truly involved, you know, people with diplomatic uh, passport and therefore allow them to switch away from Turkey. Um, so with this, uh, even there is a crime, you know, uh, alleged uh, that is committed in the promise premises of, of the uh, embassy, still, you know, local, uh, local agency cannot enter to that without consent of the uh, sending states. So uh, another case would be what happened if the, you have to uh, uh, render the help you know, to the people in the, in the embassy when there is a cases of you know, emergency or you know, fire or any uh, 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 something that uh, threats to you, the human life and uh, security of the people in this, the, the embassy. At this case, um, the cases are different for diplomatic, uh, uh, for embassy, you still need the consent from the members, uh, from the head of state. But if it is a consular, that would be less, you know, restrictive. You can enter, you know, uh, with uh, notifying the, the, the uh, head of that mission, uh, that consulate uh, general in order to get, get into. So, that would be example of uh, inviolabilities of premises, and we are talking of premises itself. Um, another inviability that is important is on the personal itself, on, on personal. Um, diplomatic agencies uh, uh, that involve, you know, in the situations uh, has been I have to be protected um, against, you know, the, the uh, case against uh, uh, arrest and detain from detention. And uh, there is a lot of cases involved, you know, in maybe in a road traffic accident, uh, when there is a, a hit and run, you know, when diplomatic are uh, involved in serious crimes or uh, uh, involved in the uh, harassment, you know, in the office, for example, and uh, those are questions that uh, arise, you know, how are we going to deal with this? There are two cases that I like to raise in uh, the case of Thailand in the older time, when there is an a alleged uh, a case of sexual harass harassment in the office uh, by the uh, head of the uh, mission there. And so what happened is that we cannot you know, prosecute this uh, head of, of mission. But what we do is that we notify, uh, because uh, we notify the, um, the, the sending state and uh, the sending state normally 
uh, will cooperate with us. What we can do is that uh, we ask, you know, for for those head of state in that in 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 in, in uh, head of mission in that case, you know, to uh, give some statement to us, you know, in uh, in a venue that is not the embassy and it's not the police station. So I mean, we provide dignity to the uh, uh, head of mission. But at the same time, we see cooperation. So I mean, he, he came and gave the statement, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, the um, the uh, the sending state uh, themselves that uh, recall this person and this uh, this uh, head of mission, and uh, he was prosecuted under the law in his countries. You know, in, in, in later on. So in this case, it's not that if you provide. Uh, personal inviolability and there would be nothing happened. Um, I think cooperation and the consent of the sending states uh, will be uh, necessary in this case. So they have the choice of waiving the uh, uh, immunity or you know, taking the issue into uh, uh, domestic uh, um, uh, litigations or whatever in, uh, in uh, 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 at home. So that would be the, the case of the personal inviolability. And uh, there was uh, another case, you know, in the old time that the spouse of uh, a foreign uh, a diplomat in Thailand, and this happened a long time ago, when we have the Songkhan holiday and we have the Songkhan festival. And uh, uh, this uh, couple went into the you know, festival uh, somewhere in Pattaya. And uh, there was some of, you know, uh, his coming uh, to, uh, sort of hit and run a little bit, you know, it, it, it accidentally hit. And this person's, um, uh, this uh, wife of the diplomats has uh, sort of uh, slapped uh, these kids, you know. I think it's happened because uh, there is uh, some exchange of, you know, uh, a situation at that time. So with intent, uh, unintentionally. And uh, that give the, uh, the law to the the, uh, the community and locality that you know you should not do this to the young uh, kids and uh, so it's happened and it, the issue was raised and was in the news you know in, in, in that that well uh, there is some uh, people think that diplomatic agents have you know been treated better than uh, those of the you know, Thai people and that sentiment can be something of the. Uh, 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 social sentiment on that issue could be something of the concern as well. But it is very, we quickly, you know, went into the issues and we discussed with uh, um, the embassies and, uh, um, and we make the public, you know, known that uh, this is an unfortunate incident and the, our uh, diplomatic uh, agencies, uh, agent, uh, that embassy will take the issue into consideration and we'll uh, uh, investigate on this and you know so uh, that can be uh, die off you know very easy, easily. Um, I would give you some other example that happened currently uh, with the quarantine um, situation in Thailand with this COVID-19 has caused a lot of you know uh, issues of diplomatic uh, protection and diplomatic, sorry, uh, diplomatic immunity and uh, privilege. Uh, if you read for, um, uh, heard from the news, there is some certain cases when we uh, implement the very strict issues and, uh, um, and we allow uh, uh, diplomatic agents to be uh, quarantined in, uh, in his residence. And it's happened that, you know, he was, uh, uh, tests as positive and then people in the resident with the exact same condominium it was like a uh, white uh, uh, diplomatic agent has a privilege for not quarantine in the uh, uh, specified hotel that we had to provide. So I think we Thailand has to work with the uh, uh, embassies you know, in order to adjust uh, this uh, uh, immunity uh, uh, and this special treatment that we have for diplomat as well. And uh, I think uh, diplomatic uh, course has to understand the 
uh, situation of domestic as well, because uh, when they're enjoying this um, privilege and immunity that the host country uh, provide and accord to them, um, they uh, have to be concerned also with the, uh, the, uh, the view from the public as well, you know, uh, in this case. So when we implement uh, um, volunteer, uh, the diplomatic envoy, some of the diplomatic envoys also, you know, concern as well, whether the, uh, because the, what we, we impose are more restrictive in what they happen in their uh, home country. And um, we discuss, you know, uh, this and try to balance between providing you know, security and uh, uh, personal inviability to the diplomatic corps. But at the same time, we have to uh, try to control the situation uh, because uh, the situation in Thailand last year, even uh, up to now, is still very uh, concerned in, in terms of the you know, spread of the COVID-19. Uh, uh, and we still don't have enough uh, 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 vaccine accessibility to all people. So we still need to strict, strengthen our quarantine time and, uh, uh, and uh, um, other tests as well, like swab tests has been uh, uh, concerned whether that invades some human rights or not, and limitation of uh, uh, travel or, you know, providing information of whereabouts the, they are uh, and, uh, confining uh, diplomatic uh, people or, or people, you know, in the certain uh, areas, you know, that would that invade the right of uh, privacy, the right of uh, freedom to, of movement, you know, in that we have to facilitate and uh, under uh, uh, Vienna Convention. So I think uh, the situation will be that we have to take the case, you know, by case, we have to take it as a case by case, and we have to balance between these two. You know, we have obligation to provide security in terms of uh, 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 in terms of uh, health and uh, uh, well-being to the people. At the same time, we also have this, you know, uh, uh, privilege and immunity that we have to provide to uh, uh, our foreign. Uh, diplomats in the country as well. So, I mean, those would be the question of inviability. So it's a premises and personal. So now I'll, I'll, I will go on to another immunity is immunity from jurisdiction. This is the issue that has uh, been arise uh, of, in many cases, you know, for example, uh, diplomatic agents file committing a crime and 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 uh, what we can do in in the early example that I was given to you you know apart from personal inviability that would be the question of uh, jurisdiction as well whether the uh, local um, uh, police can uh, prosecute on this case or not and uh, uh, criminal immunity is absolute under the Vienna Convention. I think this is uh, something. So we will not, definitely, we will not have, be able to prosecute on this diplomatic uh, call or this diplomatic agent in, in our country. And, uh, but I said at the very beginning already that uh, the, it doesn't you know, uh, prevent you from cooperating with the host uh, state, ascending state, uh, you know, in order to uh, provide some justice to the certain extent to those uh, that are the victim of the crime. So, um, so the uh, the sending state, you know, will not have uh, uh, will in some cases, especially like in the Shakovsky, uh, uh, as I uh, uh, mentioned earlier has already taken action in their home state as well, you know, on, on the issues. And that's very normal in many cases that uh, they recall the diplomatic to their home and they start prosecuting the, uh, on uh, uh, the crime that uh, those people are, are um, involved. Another issue that's uh, 
beginning to arise, you know, very uh, 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 often, you know, in 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 uh, today is whether question is whether a diplomatic agents uh, are uh, 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 needed to provide a statement in the court. There is a cases that we are facing a lot today that uh, when there is a contract that we are having uh, and uh, whether it be the high contract or the uh, or the rent of the uh, uh, some premises or even the house of the um, uh, resident of the diplomatic corps. So sometimes we have to enter into contract with the domestic uh, private persons. And uh, they would ask that uh, um, when there is a case, then we go to the domestic court. So, and uh, the contract of employ employment uh, of the local staff will uh, often arise when those lo uh, local staff are not satisfied with the condition of the uh, the, the high and purchase. So they went to the local court and uh, uh, sued for the case. And this, um, when we have, when we receive the requests from the court, you know, for uh, our diplomatic calls, uh, diplomatic agents to be given the statement in the court. The practice nowadays is that what we can do is that we notify the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, that this is happened and we are not, you know, uh, happy to, to be uh, uh, what, uh, claiming against the other or defending our case in the court. But we will cooperate by sending some statement to the court or we can provide some witness to give uh, some statement to the court. But that would be something that we need to have uh, the government uh, provide the waiver of the uh, uh, immunity in order to this, you know, to, uh, diplomatic call to be uh, able to go to give the statement in the court. So um, in Thailand, if you can, uh, uh, we are very uh, uh, considerate in uh, asking a diplomatic agent to give the statement in the court. Normally, we, we will not uh, uh, do that. And so when there is a case to the certain court in Thailand, then we inform the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and we will consider on these issues. And we said that uh, normally it has to be with consent of the uh, 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 embassies you know, to provide that or not but some countries uh, will not treat the same. So it depends on the issue uh, that are considered consider under the court as well. And if the question of uh, commercial, uh, com uh, commercial issues or something outside the, the, uh, the scope of diplomatic mission uh, uh, duty and uh, something that involves the protection of local uh, employment, uh, labor law, uh, those will be considered as a waiver in certain countries that adopt the restrictive um, uh, principle or approach to providing a uh, diplomatic uh, protection. Okay. Um, let me go, go on you know, to give you some recent example as well, you know, and this is uh, concerning uh, the example uh, applica application of diplomatic uh, immunity in the court, uh, the, uh, uh, in the ICJ. So, I mean, recent uh, cases, the most recent cases that has been considered by the ICJ court is uh, the case between uh, a quartorial uh, Equatorial Guinea and France. And uh, in this case, let me uh, uh, provide you some uh, detail of the case a little bit. 
you know, on that. Um, in this case, there is a complaint filed in the Paris a prosecutor regarding uh, the case of money laundering investigation uh, that concerned a building at the 42nd Avenue Forge, you know, in Paris. And uh, Equatorial Guinea claimed that this building has been used as embassy premises uh, uh, and that the French authority cannot enter to search or seize anything from there. Um, however, the uh, French authority argue that the building is not a, premises, uh, not a premise of the embassy and then cannot accept Equatorial Guinea later declared the uh, declaration that this premises is a uh, mission. It is a premise of the mission. It was considered as a private mission before and was later subject to criminal investigation. Uh, Equatorial Guinea has filed this application to the ICJ and regarding the case. And the ICJ found in this case that the receiving state may object to the sending state choice of premises. If this objection is communicated in a timely manner and is neither uh, uh, arbitrary or nor discriminatory in character, then that premises of property uh, will not provide, uh, will not acquire the status of premises of the mission within the meaning of article uh, one uh, I of the VCDR and therefore does not benefit from the protection of the host state under Article 22 of the Convention. So in this case, what has been the, uh, uh, the principle is that the host country has the rights you know, to give consent to whatever uh, building that has been, I mean, from the very beginning, we have to notify to the host country that what is the building, this building will be uh, used as a uh, uh, mission of the uh, diplomatic missions. And we use as an embassy, it's we use as a uh, um, uh, consulate, you know, where we uh, provide uh, diplomatic activities. There is a question arise, you know, from this, uh, um, judgment as well, you know, whether uh, can a sending, uh, can a uh, host state object to the sending state of the, uh, of, uh, uh, of specifying that this is a premises of the, uh, the, the embassy or not. This happens to us as well uh, in various countries that sometimes uh, we acquire uh, se uh, several buildings that are used as embassy and at a certain time that building has not been used and it has been, you know, invaded by other, uh, other uh, uh, from homeless or from other, you know, neighbor, neighbor uh, uh, the people in the neighborhood uh, to that building. And this is the rights um, of the uh, hostess, you know, to consider that that will not be longer used as a, uh, embassy and we will not be considered as a premises that uh, would gain inviability. Um, so this case will be uh, something that arises from this as well. But I have to say that diplomatic uh, diplomacy is based on trust. So um, once um, once the uh, sending state has identified certain uh, area and uh, notify the home state, uh, host state already. The host state has to be, uh, in most cases, you know, recognized and adhere to whatever uh, the request of the uh, sending states uh, would be. But in the case of uh, uh, ICG case that I mentioned before, that because it's notified later than, later on in that case, Equatorial uh, 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 Guinea has notified the French authority after the situations or the case has been uh, going on already. So it would not uh, consider as the premises of the mission. So 
I think that is a very good example when you uh, have to consider nowadays when you apply diplomatic immunity, uh, there is a national interest of the receiving states uh, at one hand and uh, the mutual trust between the party of uh, and diplomatic relations uh, between the party, uh, between the host state and sending state on the other hand. And these have to be weighed and balanced you know, in, in considering of providing uh, diplomatic immunity to the uh, foreign mission. Um, let me go uh, skip you know, to, to the other point that uh, is very important for, uh, for Thailand at the moment. That is a practice that we have to balance between diplomatic immunity and duty of foreign uh, uh, agencies, uh, agents has to, uh, to respect local law. Uh, as I mentioned already, this issue of balancing between these two uh, come uh, to our attention you know, more and more in recent practice of uh, diplomatic protection. Um, Thailand has uh, provided, uh, I mean, Thailand is a country that adopts absolute immunity uh, principle. Uh, we are not like uh, uh, European countries or other countries that uh, adopt restrictive, uh, uh, restrictive, uh, restrictive, you know, immunity, both to state immunity and diplomatic uh, immunity as well. And uh, there is challenges, you know, when you interpret the um, Vienna Conventions. You know, I think the core is that uh, why. Uh, uh, you uh, acquire, acquire um, diplomatic immunity, but at the same time, you have to respect the law of the country as well. This principle is stated in Vietnam Convention on the Law of Street, uh, on, uh, on, on the Diplomatic Relation, Article 41. I mean, 41 is the core that without uh, prejudice to their privilege and immunities, it is a duty of all persons enjoy such privilege and immunity to respect the laws and regulations of the receiving state. They also have a duty not to interfere to the attention affairs of that state as well. So I mean, uh, we kept it at the very very beginning that without prejudice to their privileges and immunity, and it's a duty. So um, can I go back to the previous slides? I think this is uh, show you very, very much of the current situation that we are having now is that when we have diplomatic relation, uh, uh, immunity, we have duty of the law, of the uh, regulations of receiving state on the other hand. And the issue that are considering at the moment, that are under considering at the moment is the health, uh, public health security. There is some politics in the domestic um, uh, uh, in the host country, and there is a medical requirements uh, example that I like to give to you. So let me start with uh, first uh, when we have to quarantine and we have to provide some uh, medical requirements. Uh, there was some challenges, you know, uh, to uh, that whether the quarantine situation that we are. Uh, uh, taken measure that we are taking, whether this is a limitation to freedom of movement, movement that's provided under Article 26 of the BCDR or not, whether its effect on personal inviolability as stated in 29, Article 29. If state designate mandatory uh, quarantine location, does this amount to the ten detention or arrest? You know, some might go that far. And family and diplomatic agents also need to quarantine, whether this affect them or not, as providing in under Article 37. And why are these challenges uh, understandable? Scientific facts and the very special uh, circumstances we are is also need to be taken into consideration. 
um, when uh, we adopt very restrictive uh, uh, quarantine uh, and uh, work from home and uh, limit on the uh, movement of people in Thailand from the very beginning, there was, uh, we have to make, uh, there was uh, some protests, I have to admit, from many uh, diplomatic, uh, 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 from many embassies. And we hold the uh, uh, consultation between them and we try to explain. And at, this, at that time, I think uh, we need, these two are international obligation for Thailand as well. So we have to provide uh, security and we have to adhere to the measures uh, that uh, require member state of uh, WHO to protect human, human um, uh, uh, well-being and the health of the people. And in order to um, uh, control the spread of the virus uh, of the, uh, of the COVID-19, we need to implement something of this. And I think this is a balance. I always stated that you need to control and also you need to provide protection as well. And um, when the situation is prolonged, uh, we gain more acceptable form, the diplomatic calls, and they understand the situations and they have been cooperating very well. But at the very beginning, it's quite difficult to, to for us as well. So, um, I would say, uh, I would go to the last example. So the COVID-19 was the uh, pandemics and the public health is one example. And I will uh, touch uh, my last point on the very reason again, uh, uh, challenge, you know, with the uh, indirect cohesion of uh, measures, you know, that affect the uh, uh, diplomatic uh, agents and uh, our embassy abroad as well. Um, in this case, involved an indirect cohesion measure through financial institutions uh, that appear in various anti-money laundering and uh, terrorism law. So uh, we, uh, you might be well aware that uh, there is an increase, you know, a cooperation between states to uh, uh, to follow the transfer of money and uh, and to monitor uh, this and uh, this in this example I would uh, pick up the EU directive on the prevention of the use of the financial system for the purpose of money laundering or terrorism uh, financing. The main article of this is the article 3, 9, 10, and 11. Um, in this directive, article 3, 9 uh, has provided some monitoring and reporting to the agencies of the uh, uh, activities in uh, uh, um, transfer in and out and financial activity uh, through the bank account of the premises of the uh, uh, certain people. And in this directive, identify people with politically exposed persons to means a natural person who is or who are entrusted with prominent public function, including ambassadors, social affairs, and high-ranking officers in the armed force. I mean, it is very uh, clear from the directive that uh, ambassador and such uh, affairs and those high ranking of officials uh, can be considered as a political exposed persons and need to report uh, uh, any transactions through their bank account to the to the local authorities. And this come with a job because we have been uh, asked from the bank that are the embassy that are holding uh, the account there to ask us to report uh, every uh, transaction 
and that we cannot use the uh, cash transaction and you need to have uh, the system of transfer or recorded of the every transaction that's uh, dealing with the embassy and it's caused a lot of difficult to, difficulty to our embassies because normally when we operate we use the cash uh, uh, um, method of payments uh, like for visa and for this certain thing and the issue is more than that is that uh, the diplomatic calls in those countries uh, has been uh, getting together and asked that whether this is uh, whether this is um, uh, the right uh, uh, way to do to diplomatic call and um, and there's putting not only burden on the diplomatic call but that could invade in the diplomatic immunity of the diplomatic calls as well and um, we have received uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the explanation from the host countries that this is in order to uh, provide uh, the uh, due diligence and of, that need to be done by financial institutions and uh, they need to include that identification and verification of customer and they have to monitor transaction or business relations they have to identify the benefit owner and taking reasonable me measures to verify the person identity and also they have to assess the information they are providing whether that uh, 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 is uh, correct or not and these measures will be applied by the bank by the financial institutions and not the government directly so if we are not comply with this uh, we will definitely have problem with the uh, uh, opening of the uh, bank account with the, that host it. So with this, I would uh, conclude by a couple words with this slide uh, again that there is um, increasingly more and more issues that are uh, challenged to the application of uh, diplomatic immunity um, that diplomatic impunity that we provide as I said for Thailand very absolutely we provide to every diplomatic call and our agents will apply that very strictly you know to uh, give the diplomatic call uh, personal immunity um, immunity from jurisdiction immunity from execution and immunity from personal immunity as well and premises but at the same time, we need to have some policy and some uh, regulations and some other law that a host country have to apply as well. So there will be cases that happen and we have to consult you know, among each other and look at the purpose of the Vietnam Convention. I would predict that uh, there will be more challenge on this uh, diplomatic immunity uh, more and more in the future. Thank you. So I'm happy that uh, you might have any question you can raise and, uh, and uh, I'm happy to, to answer any question and discuss with you on any specific issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Villuan, for this uh, um, excellent overview of what I think are the practical issues um, when we have to deal with the diplomatic law and the issues of immunities, I, uh, I think it's fair to say that's also my experience uh, that these are um, daily issues uh, that arise uh, in uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in particular uh, in the role of a legal advisor, the head of the, diplom the, 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 the legal department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So this is uh, not abstract uh, theoretical debates, but very, very practical issues, difficult that require, as you said, a lot of balance between the different interests um, and, of course, a lot of trust 
uh, between the sending state and the receiving uh, receiving state, and you illustrated very well in terms of the type practice and issues of uh, inviolability of premises, uh, personal inviolability, uh, the questions of, uh, of course, um, uh, the need to respect local laws, and and the issue that I think uh, you know all states were grappling. Uh, for the past two years, which is uh, how to articulate uh, the laws of diplomatic immunities and uh, pandemics and the protection of public health. And, and this has been certainly a challenge, um, uh, both for receiving states and, and, and sending states. So I see we have uh, one question. I don't want to take uh, more uh, of the time and, 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 and we'll go straight to the questions. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, that I will ask you because uh, um, it's interesting. Maybe you can give a bit more information. Uh, the question is, uh, um, is there any recommended further reading regarding <laughs> indirect coercion measures? Uh, because it's a new concept uh, for uh, Ayman from Brunei. Um, so wow. I don't know if you have, maybe we can also uh, see afterwards if you could uh, recommend um, and, and would, would share, <laughs> um, we would share that to students. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't well, I, I don't think that that's very new. You know, I don't think that uh, uh, anyone uh, uh, writing on that yet. But uh, as I, I can elaborate a little bit, that um, that um, because this is the first. I mean, you can look at the uh, directive. This is the first time that diplomatic uh, agent, you know, has been classified as a. You know, person with uh, 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 inference. So, um, a minute. Let me look at the, the wording again. Sorry. Can I, can I read? Yeah, um, because uh, it it is already identified. You know, ambassadors and uh, charge affairs and high ranking officers in armed forces as well. You know, uh, as a politically exposed person. You know, I, I think this is a challenge uh, definitely for the diplomatic uh, a course that is the concerns as you know, we're not involved, you know, normally in the politics or anything with that. But uh, uh, um, uh, this uh, has been included not in the general law, but in the specific financial laws, you know, and it's already applied to, to the private sector, I mean, to the bank. So uh, uh, I would say that uh, there is no reading on this, there is no article on this yet. It's just really uh, something that are new. And, uh, but I mean, you probably asked your Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, because uh, there is a group of the diplomatic uh, agents there, uh, embassies that get together and have, uh, you know, talking to the several um, uh, European countries that's adopting this, uh, this, this uh, directive. And, and, and uh, as I said, but I mean, it's, it's, it's the, uh, the argument is that uh, Article 41, although you have this diplomatic uh, uh, protection uh, and diplomatic immunities, but you still need to respect law, local law and uh, domestic law, which are uh, implementing some certain issue to specifically uh, deal with the problem, especially in this case, you know, transnational crime, terrorism, and which are something that the EU also have obligation under international law. So there is a conflicting, as I said, from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Indeed, indeed, it's a new question and, and a difficult one. And we will, uh, <laughs> we can share, we can share them with the text of the directive with our participants. Okay. I think that that would also be uh, good. So we have a request for a live ah. question from Ankit. Uh, ah. I see him, uh, Ankit from India. So Ankit, if you wanted to turn on your mic and ask your question, please go ahead. Well, I turn on my mic and my camera. <laughs> uh, my, my question is about uh, not readings, but practical engagement. I mean, as, as embassies, you're really vestiges of or final contours of, 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 of public image. 
and my question is during covid and also perhaps in a post covid scenario how do you imagine and also practice public diplomacy because that's that's a important aspect which 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 you as embassies have to 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 carry out and this is something which you don't really see in the mandate but is extremely important so i was just curious to know how do you do this uh, or, or conduct this 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 rather important exercise you mean to to have the uh, uh, local or public you know understand this uh, diplomatic immunity uh, at the same time of uh, 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 preserving the understanding from domestic is that is that a question uh, yes mm -hmm. um, well I think um, um, I think uh, we need to explain. I mean, uh, uh, when we have this uh, question arise, you know, whether we provide protection uh, to diplomatic uh, agents uh, too too much, and then and that, and when they uh, uh, have a strong sentiment from domestic, uh, I think the 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 best way to deal with this is to be quick. You know, is uh, to talk to the diplomatic agents and also you know we, we 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 hold a press conference you know even in some cases you know to give the public understanding that these uh, people are not you know uh, uh, above the law i mean i would say you know but uh, there are certain uh, respect that we have to be given and uh, we have to uh, provide to the public of the uh, the situations and we have to clarify and at the same time we also need to uh, uh, cooperate with the uh, diplomatic uh, agents as well as embassy that embassies you know the certain uh, issues that we can uh, sort of you know back down a little bit uh, in our case at the very beginning of the uh, COVID-19 uh, diplomatic calls are allowed to quarantine at their residence. So that was, that's why it's happened in, in this specific case that uh, the resident happened to be the uh, condominium where there is other people as well. Uh, but uh, later on, we uh, after the incident, we have been corporate that uh, the diplomatic call has backed down a little bit, you know, to quarantine in the isolated, uh, 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 that, uh, identified uh, um, uh, uh, place, you know, that could be a hotel or, uh, or even in the embassy themselves or the residents, you know, themselves, but those have to be uh, told to the public and also um, isolated, you know. So I, I think we sort of, you know, negotiate and communicate among uh, together and uh, and all this diplomatic call is ready to to cooperate because they don't want to see us you know um, as a bad guy I mean you know they, 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 they are living in our countries and they want to cooperate in any aspect I would say thank you Thank you so much. And so one thing is that our very diligent teaching assistant, Harry, has already put the link to the directive in the chat box. So okay, all wow, participants have access. <laughs> Thank you. And, excellent. And there's a question from Costa uh, from uh, Tanzania, who okay. wrote it in the chat. Uh, I think it's an issue that you had, you know, foreseen to cover in your slides, but because of lack of time, you didn't do it. It's about the distinction between diplomatic immunity and state immunity. Um, we've been talking more, of course, about diplomatic immunity and also in the lectures uh, with uh, Professor Philip Webb yesterday and tomorrow, it's more about diplomatic immunity. But the question is, um, well, I would like to know the distinction between diplomatic immunity and state immunity. Is state immunity absolute? Is there an enforceable legal instrument which addresses state immunity? So that wow. is the question. And I think you had that in your slides yeah. and we can also share yeah. them, but it would be yeah. good if you could explain it, please. Yeah. Uh, 
I think because uh, the lack of time, so I will share that slide. Uh, of course, when we are, there's some uh, uh, theory, you know, where it's still, you know, not conclusive, but I mean, there is a theory that uh, diplomatic immunities arise from uh, state immunity, I mean, the start from starting, but I mean, that's not conclusive. But uh, different would be uh, the act, the, uh, um, the, the um, subject of that immunity. I mean, when they are, you are diplomatic immunity, there is a certain uh, Vienna Convention that I said, you know, specify provision for that, and uh, that would be easy. But as to state immunity, is uh, the principle that uh, uh, you do not uh, try other uh, state in your jurisdiction because we are equal under um, the international sphere. So it's a principle that are there. And uh, some countries has already implement some uh, uh, provisions, uh, uh, I mean, the domestic law on that, you know, like um, European, many European country have a state immunity law, uh, Singapore have, and um, me in Thailand, we are <clears throat> trying as well, but uh, uh, it would be a long way because uh, drafting uh, a law, uh, uh, we just finished the privilege and immunity on uh, international organizations and that took uh, a few years, you know, to, to complete that. And uh, this is on the topic, uh, this uh, State Immunity Act would be uh, on uh, our agenda, but it would be take some time. So I think uh, that would be something that uh, uh, depends on the practice of the states. And what happened uh, today when we have the case against uh, 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 our embassies, for example, like um, the case of, um, buy property, for example, you know, to, to buy a property. Uh, and uh, the case when it's against, uh, when we are sued or taking into court, the, uh, uh, the claimer usually, you know, uh, claimants usually uh, sue both the government of Thailand or the uh, you know, Thai embassy in whatever, New York or whatever. Uh, so those two issues is come in practice, come together. And we definitely, in terms of our uh, em uh, ambassadors and diplomatic agents, we apply uh, diplomatic uh, 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 immunity so they will not participate in, in, in the case. But that's not prevent the case to go on. You know, and and, and uh, to go on in certain, uh, uh, and finally we have the judgment to that, and it's come to the question of uh, of the uh, enforcement of that judgment on you know our might be uh, uh, accounts in that countries or might be the property in a certain country, and that when we have to apply to uh, state immunity and. Uh, it has been restrictive, you know, in, in a lot of, of countries. But in Thailand case, when there is a case against the uh, uh, government of foreign countries, the court, uh, currently the court uh, will not uh, uh, accept, you know, the, the, the case. I mean, they will, uh, uh, they will uh, refuse to accept the case because as we apply, the uh, uh, strict, I mean, the uh, absolute. So I would say that uh, there is, of course, there are some of the law that I implement in certain country and there's some conventions like European conventions on state immunity and also the IRC uh, 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 convention as well on the state immunity in, uh, in terms of property. And, uh, but I um, mean, a lot of countries are not members to that. So we still have to apply on the case by case as a country uh, uh, and uh, depends on the country itself as well. Thank you very much. I'm trying to see if there are more questions. Uh, I, the, the issue of the 2004 UN Convention on, on uh, State Immunity, uh, Jurisdictional Immunities of States and their Property is very interesting because it's, uh, again, I mean, something that the ILC did 
uh, but it's not yet in force. So it's still customary international law that uh, rules and there's, you know, there's a movement between uh, from absolute immunity to relative immunity, but it's not uh, the same in every single country. So it does still depend a little bit on, on the jurisdiction. Uh, so that's also something that is very interesting to to follow and, and something that, again, you know, from the point of view of ministers of foreign affairs, it's something that, uh, you know, falls on your desk <laughs> very frequently sure. Uh, for, for sure. So I don't see any more uh, questions. Oh, there's one last question. If you have time, uh, Dr. Villawan, we would appreciate we have this uh, last question from, um, from NOLA from the Pacific region. Um, asking if Thailand, uh, has Thailand experienced the recent situation where a legal action has to be taken uh, against the former employee head of an international organization, for example, that has returned to his or her home uh, mm -hmm. country sending state where immunity no longer applies. So the question of the residual <laughs> um, immunity um, uh, that somebody had um, immunity and then return and how uh, does that uh, come into play? So that's the last um, last okay. question. Okay, I mean, uh, if it's our uh, diplomatic agents abroad and coming back, uh, of course, you know, we have uh, certain cases that we uh, 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 taking action against uh, that person, uh, as long as you know the crimes or whatever uh, uh, are considered to be a violence of our domestic law. And if the, um, the uh, period, uh, the, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, there is still uh, very, uh, valid under our law. I mean, in terms of the, um, the right now? period, Statute. statutory period uh, of case, you know, like if you are in, um, uh, in uh, some crimes that have 10 years, you know, uh, limitation periods and if it's still under that, we, we will take some action against. But uh, the questions would be very difficult when normally if this case happened in, in the, the host state, I mean, um, in the home the host state, uh, all the evidence or something might be there. So, I mean, I will, will not be prosecuted there. So there, there are a lot of uh, difficulty for us to prosecute on that person. But uh, yes, if it's happened uh, for us, we will do. But if another way around, if it's happened to the uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic agents, foreign diplomatic agent in Thailand and we send them back and we recall, uh, we have been followed, but uh, it will up, definitely up to the uh, sending states, you know, whether they will going to take action against uh, them or not. But in Thailand, we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for agreeing to go a little bit over time. Uh, but this is, I mean, your presentation was so rich and your, your PowerPoint slides were even uh, more comprehensive. Uh, I'm sure that students will appreciate uh, that we share them uh, with them so that they can uh, follow up uh, on, on, on every issue. And, uh, and I have to say that, uh, I mean, your presentation shows how, you know, alive these questions are on a daily basis, but at the same time, how, and this is something I like to know, to, to, to stress, I've, uh, I've also, you know, been involved in many of these questions a bit like, uh, um, uh, like from your side, from a practical point of view, and, and recently put together um, a commentary to the Vienna Convention uh, on the law of uh, on diplomatic relations from the Portuguese point of view with the Portuguese practice, because every country has, you know, a very rich practice. And, and, and I think that uh, from all the work that the ILC has carried out, and, and of course, you know, many successful uh, products that came out. This is probably the best seller, uh, you know, the Vienna Conventions on Law of Diplomatic Relations and, and Consular Relations in the sense that uh, they are the most widely uh, ratified um, uh, instruments that were initiated by the International Law Commission. At the same time, I think they are uh, ones that have uh, stood very well the test of time, uh, you know, facing new realities um, and, and, and circumstances that were certainly unforeseen when the convention was being drafted like a pandemic. And you illustrated that very, uh, very, very well. So 
Um, let me uh, close uh, today's session. Again, a very successful guest uh, lecture um, and, and with a warm thanks from Nilofer, uh, Oral and my, and, my, and my part and also on behalf of all the participants of the CIL Academy. It was a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Vilwan. And uh, thank you for taking the time and, and sharing your experience. And tomorrow we will continue uh, with uh, Professor Philippa Webb uh, to conclude our module uh, for week five. So thanks again, and uh, you know, virtual <laughs> collab uh, applause from uh, from uh, all of us, from all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.